I would like to inform all participants on this call. So please make use of the chat room the way they want it to appear on the certificate for this training and also include their phone number afterwards, their name and phone number. The name, the way they want it to appear on the certificate yeah, for the training and also include their phone number. Also, anybody who is not speaking should kindly mute themselves. Thank you very much. Dr. Kolari, continue, sir. So, we want to spend a few minutes to talk about strict biosecurity for optimal farm performance. And um, why are we talking about this? It's, it's because all intensive systems come with heightened disease in, uh, incidents and spread the risk of uh, the video we watched uh, before this program started we saw a poultry house that birds were very many in a single house and uh, the speaker to that video was saying that uh, the birds are healthy it was talking about the risk of disease in nature we all stay in we give ourselves natural gaps but once you pack people together in one place or living things together in one in one space you have you have increased the risk of disease occurring and the risk of disease spreading faster um that is easy to explain but all of us having the recent experience of covid 19 the attack of covid 19 the rates of the severity of COVID-19 was highest in places where people gathered most, for example, in Nigeria, Lagos. So that is why uh, when you bring living things together in intensive numbers, you have to get worried about the risk of disease incidence and disease spread. And commercial poultry production is by its nature an intensive system. You are bringing so many birds together in as little space as possible. So the next thing is to ask yourself, how do we take care of the risk? How do we avoid the risk of diseases occurring too frequently or in, in rates that can, that can make you to lose your investment? So profitable poultry in production, therefore, must include mitigating the risk of disease effectively and consistently. Not just that you, you mitigate it effectively, but that you consistently mitigate that risk. And today, we want to focus on biosecurity as the most effective measure to avoid this risk or to mitigate this risk in our uh, business. I'd like to paint some, in some setups uh, where, how do they control disease in some setups? How do they control disease in some? Just a little difficulty with my screen share. Let me just give me a second. Maybe, maybe I will. I will just. Can you still see me? Yes, we can yes, see we can. you now. Yes, we can see you. Uh, maybe I'll, okay. Um, in in global best practices, uh, disease prevention stands on three legs. Biosecurity, vaccination, and antibiotics. I see that ring around the baby chick. And what is done on that ring, you can see the blue part of the ring. Biosecurity is a major element for the prevention of disease. Next to that is vaccination, which is that red or wine color. And last, which takes a little portion of it, 
is antibiotics. This is the what you will call what you will call the global best practice for disease prevention. Biotic security is a major element. But in our climb here, what you find is that for disease prevention, antibiotics form the major component. And then the abuse of vaccines is the next one. And biosecurity, which should be the major strand or the major leg for the prevention of disease, is what is now the least in our and this has consequences. For instance, two abuse of antibiotics, and it also means that there could be the risk antibiotic resistance for people who make use of our products, who eat our products. And that is another topic entirely. Um, abuse of vaccination also means that this is our boss that we are trying to protect. We are actually ultimately exposing them to greater danger because vaccines are like a double-edged sword. They can help you, but if abused, they can also land you in trouble. And today's World Egg Day is not a day for uh, too much uh, grammar. We're just trying to uh, land this. I will focus more on the practical side of um, our discussion on biosecurity. But uh, nevertheless, it's important to establish for us that biosecurity is the intentional avoidance of disease through a planned program of risk reduction. In other words, it is something that you do intentionally, deliberately to keep disease out of your plant, out of your farm, of any agriculture, any livestock operation. And how do you do it? You, you have a plan of what you're going to do to ensure that the risk of disease outbreak is reduced. It is a set of management practices which reduce the potential for the introduction and then for the spread of disease-causing organisms into or between sites. That is, the, what are we going to do on our farm to ensure that germs, things that can cause disease, do not enter our farm or do not spread from our farm to other people or to other farms. So it involves identifying and eliminating all possible routes by which disease could be accidentally introduced to your flocks. That is, you are looking at how many ways can this thing enter and you want to block all such ways so that disease cannot enter your flock. So and it's an action thing. It involves taking steps to prevent the introduction and the spread of these infectious agents from this farm to, to come into your farm and to go from your farm to other farms. So it's always requiring you to have a program. This program uh, uses a combination of physical barriers, which I call things, and directed actions, which I call people, and in a specific way that you prevent the introduction of or limit the spread of disease-causing agents, which are bacteria and viruses majorly, and then a, num a few fungi and other, other types of germs into a group of our animals that have the capacity to fall sick if we introduce these uh, living things to their midst. So what you want to do is you want to ensure that you, you combine physical barriers these things don't enter, and in case they enter, they cannot do their damage. So, this definition that I have explained uh, embodies all the things that you need to do to prevent uh, so many of these um, viruses, bacteria, fungi from entering or from surviving and thus infecting or endangering 
your flock. Now, I said that, that it involves the use of things. So, what are the things? Don't forget, I said to that side of uh, this topic. So, what are the things that you can use to reduce or eliminate the risk of agents? Should I even call them agents of evil? Because disease in a commercial farm, you can call it evil. It, it destroys it. It destroys your investment. So, the first thing is fences. Uh, if you have a fence around your farm, it means that people, animals, vectors cannot enter anyhow. So, and when I say fence, I know the first thing that will come to your mind is that thing made of blocks, plastered, not necessarily. Fences can be wire. In fact, in some places, cactus fences are effective. In some places, bamboo fences are effective. But whatever it is that is effective and within your means, there should be a way to ensure that there is a barricade around the entrance is definite. Yeah. Just like the case of Nigeria, why is it difficult to, to control the problems that we are facing as a country now, particularly insurgency and smuggling. Oh. The Nigerian Customs Services, how many will they man? So, well, we know that they can use technology to man our border, but the point we are making is that when there are too many points from which the enemy can enter, then it becomes more difficult for you. But if you have secured the perimeter and then there is a definite gate through which those who want to enter can assess your facility, it becomes easier for you to control what comes in and what goes out. So a fence is not just a, a tool of economic security. It is also a tool of biosecurity for your farm. The same goes for gates and uh, doors gates to the premises, doors to facilities. You might have a, a fence to the farm, but if there are no doors to specific penthouses that can be opened and locked uh, uh, deliberately, the wrong persons or the wrong living things can enter your penthouse. Your farm is secure, quite all right. The wrong persons can enter and you will be in trouble. For instance, it is a general rule that people who are working with older boards in the large farm, for instance, people who are working with older boards should not enter into the penthouses where younger boards or chicks are being taken care of. If there are no barriers, they might just saunter into the place to go and play with their friends, to go and talk to their friends, and as they go there with their shoes and with their clothes, they can carry jams that the older birds have uh, 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 developed resistance again into the flock of younger birds that are just coming up. And those ones will fall sick because there is no uh, limitation to who can enter. So gates and doors, then some sprayers. Part of what we'll be talking about is the place of using disinfectants. And disinfectants are better when sprayed rather than poured, particularly in the environment. So if you do not have something like a sprayer on a regular poultry farm, you are denying yourself of the benefits that even the disinfectant that you have bought with a lot of money should give you. Today, uh, there are disinfectants that you buy in six digits of Naira. And then you now you have bought it, and then you, you do not have a sprayer with which to spray it in the environment. And uh, that little ex additional expense of getting a good sprayer that you did not incur will render that huge, massive expense 
of disinfectants that you have bought to be useless. Now, the use of things uh, for biosecurity, things as simple as detergents. You know, uh, I wrote detergents before disinfectants because cleaning comes before disinfection. A lot of times our disinfectants don't work as effectively as they should work because we did not first clean before we started disinfecting. So you give the disinfectant unnecessary work to do, unnecessary workload, because you did not first clean. So detergents are good for cleaning. And um, before we now come to disinfectant, I will still talk a lot more about disinfectants later. So let me jump um, for now. But it's among the things that are used to, to institute biosecurity measures on the farm. Boots and foot dips, or, or I may say, or should I just say footwear and foot dips? Uh, one major part of our body that human beings use to spread disease causing agents are our footwear. And so it should be a rule, however small your livestock operation is. And now I, I even extend that to uh, ruminants, pigree, any livestock operation. Because people tend to think this rule only applies to poultry. Any livestock operation, even if you are having a cattle farm, the, big, the larger animals, people should drop their footwear at the gate and take the farm footwear if they must enter into your um, penthouses or into the, deep into the premises. Because the more their country footwear moves at around within the penthouse, the more they spread whatever it is they are bringing from outside. So it's important that a farm has its own dedicated footwear that is disinfected from time to time that you give to visitors who are coming into your premises. Overalls are also part of this. Then one of the things that I used to provide um, uh, to institute of security is fire, or you call it flame. Yeah, because it is not produced in Nigeria, uh, there is something called flame gun. Because it is not produced in Nigeria and it is a bit difficult to, to import, this uh, tool, this thing, it has not caught very well in our system. But it's, 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 still, it's still worth saying since we are trying to be globally competitive, that one instrument of terminal disinfection is fire. It's called a flame gun, uh, where whatever has escaped your, your detergent, has escaped your disinfectant, will not escape fire. And fire of the soil, not the, of the soil that will burn your farm. There's a tool called the flame gun that is used to institute this fire that kills at the last minute germs and even some uh, arthropods that might be in the corners of our uh, premises. Then there are sentinels, that is things or, or, or sometimes animals that alert us to danger around or to, or to unwanted persons or living things around us. You see a picture of a dog in, in that. I know that this is a, a subject of debate, but in many places, it is reckoned that a, a trained dog can even be a, a, an, a contributor to improve biosecurity on your farm. So the point being made here is that there are things you can use to institute biosecurity measures on your farm. So. Quickly, we'll go to the next one, which is people. You need people because biosecurity is a team effort. You need those who own the farm, the management, to be conscious of biosecurity, to be conscious that we need to keep germs out. You know, management tends to watch figures. They are worried about the cost of DO cheese, the cost of feed, the... Uh, uh, when did people resume? When did they close? Did they steal eggs? But as management is worried about all of that, 
management should also be worried about hope jams are not entering, through which ways are jams entering our farm? What should we do to keep jams out of our farm? You see, I this point is important because many farms don't have disinfectants, for example, because management do not see disinfectant as a need. They, they can buy feed. They can buy, what again? They can buy, they can even buy cars, but they don't want to buy disinfectant. So it's, it's important that we get management people to understand the importance of biosecurity. Secondly, uh, uh, for large farms or even medium farms, uh, uh, people who are in charge of security for their farm. Because more often than not, they are the ones who enforce biosecurity measures at the entrance of the farm. Um, there is a particular premises I went sometimes that they had a foot deep. I will talk about the foot deep. Uh, they, they have a foot deep at their gate. They had disinfectants inside. And then someone wore a relatively new pair of shoes for the place. And, and the man want to dip his footwear in the in the disinfectant food dip. And the security man said, I'm sorry, sir, if you are not going to dip your foot, you are not going to come inside. That is a security man that understands our security. In some other places, the security man will look away. And as he's looking away, he's endangering the, the business. Then family, they also have to understand um, the importance of biosecurity. Because particularly for farms owned by mothers, many times children just come from school and they run straight into the penthouse. And because it is it's Madame's son, they allow the child to wear the school shoes into the penthouse. It is wrong. So every member of the family should also understand the need for uh, biosecurity. There is more to say on that, but I am, I am just making it brief, maybe during discussion. So there is also, there is also the need for attendance. In fact, I, they are very critical. Attendance must understand the importance of biosecurity, poultry attendants, because they are the ones closest to the birds. So if they do not do the right thing, they can undermine the entire process. And then customers, uh, it's very important that those who are buying are made to understand why certain things have to be done to protect the, the birds. Well, they may not take it to heart because when they spoil your farm, they will go to another farm and uh, to the next farm that has eggs or chicken to sell. But you as the owner of a farm should ensure that you make it clear to your customers that this and this and this are things that you have instituted because you want the farm to survive. Then we have scientists. Um, many of the enemies when we are talking about biosecurity, are enemies that you cannot see with your naked eye. So you will need to depend on uh, scientists, you need to depend on laboratories, particularly if you are doing commercial poultry farming. And even if you are doing um, backyard poultry farming, you still don't want your birds to die. And the same way, when you don't want human beings to die, you take them to the hospital, they do laboratory tests, is the same way these things are available for poultry and all of us should endeavor to avail ourselves of that. There are more people who are involved in the government, the industry, and everyone, it, everybody needs to work together to ensure that biosecurity becomes effective. For instance, if you have done all you need to do, if government has the wrong policy, despite the fact that you have done all you need to do at your own level, diseases like um, swine fever, like avian influenza, might still come to your farm with the wrong government policy. 
So that is why it is a it's it's a it's a joint effort for all stakeholders. But as you say, even if others are not doing, at least take care of your own backyard. And many of the things that we are saying today are things that you can use to take care of your own backyard, irrespective of what others are doing at their end. So let's talk a little more about the prevention of entry. What are routes of entry to your to your penthouse uh, by land, by air? Um, and because there are also birds that can, you get to some poultry places and birds can fly into the penthouse. This is not good. So you don't want to uh, allow anything to come. Not, and, it, and don't forget also that uh, birds can be carriers of disease. And then um, one other that we are going to talk about is that uh, there are germs that are present in the air regularly. And you want to see, is there a way I can prevent them from gaining or becoming dominant in my environment? That it, it sometimes has to do also with um, ensuring that your air is as clean as possible. If we have the time, we'll talk more about it. But let's talk about land. You must have control of access, and that requires you to make physical barriers. We've we'll talked about the gates, we we'll talk about doors. There are also the places where you have to put no entry, strict biosecurity in effect. And you can see that on straight from the gate, visitors please respect uh, um, farm biosecurity. So these are things that can make people to be aware that this is not a tourist center. People are not welcome just anyhow. And that can help a lot. When you have said no entry, anyone that passes that point knows that he is trespassing and you have a right to sanction such a person. Quickly, let's go to prevention of the survival of um, germs. And that leads us to the point about cider legion. Cider means things that kill. So what can we use to kill germs on the ground, in the air, and in our consumables? We need to know and we need to get them. Majorly, we talk about disinfectants. Now, there are disinfectants to apply on the ground. There are disinfectants that you can put in your uh, knapsack and spray in the air. And there are disinfectants or growth inhibitors that you can put in some of your consumables such that the, the feed, the water will not become a, a source of infection. So water sanitizers in water, growth inhibitors in, 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 in feed. Now we know that antibiotic growth promoters have been, um, have been banned, but even at that, there are many nutrition, nutraceuticals that you can put in feed that will enable your feed to be more healthy for your animals. So maybe during the discussion, if the need arises, we'll talk more about that. Now, to prevent the survival of germs on your, on your farm premises, it's not only about killing them. It is also possible to flush them. And that is where good old water comes in. If you have access to water, you, you have sometimes, or particularly on surfaces, you can use water alone to reduce the load of germs on your, on your farm by a significant percentage. Many of us know this um, um, spray thing that car washes have. If you have that kind of spray equipment on your farm and you use that to spray uh, with water, you would spray the floor, sometimes spray equipment, you would have cleaned them up to a point, flushed away germs. And then if you can add detergents to the water, you know, detergents have a way of lowering surface tension and thereby making it easy to dislodge both things that eyes can see 
and things that eyes cannot see from the surfaces. So in addition to having cider agents, it is good to have flushing agents on your farm. And um, people may be thinking of machines. In, in, in my premises, there is something as simple as put a hose to a pipe, open the pipe, and put your finger at the mouth, mouth of the hose. And you see that the water comes at a certain pressure that is not that is higher than if you just left the hose to, to run. Those of us who have washed tires of cars will, will remember what I'm talking about. When you want to wash the tire, you, you put your hand on the hose and then the, the, the water suddenly has greater pressure and it can clean your tire faster. So in addition to cider agents, flushing agents, in fact, can enable you to spend less on cider agent. That is, if you, if you flush very well, you will need to use less disinfectants to disinfect. So, so flushing, cleaning uh, is first of all, and it, it, the, the argument that people now make that disinfectants take a lot of money will be well reduced if we use water and detergents creatively on our farms. So another way is to pre prevent spread. But most times when disease wants to enter a, a, a flock, it, it starts with a few of the animals and then it begins to spread to others. So we, one thing we can do is to use what exogenous agents to combat the party, that is supply something into the environment to, to, to fight the disease causing organism. As you can see in the picture, this is a sprayer being sprayed so that in the environment, the load of either virus or bacteria is reduced. Spray the air, spray the floor, spray the pen environment. And that way, the number, because every germ has a critical mass before they can make the animals fall sick. That is, they have to be plenty up to a point before you will see sickness. As you know, many of us, they said, if you check the blood of the average Nigerian, you will always find malaria parasites, but they have to multiply up to a point before you start feeling sick. Then when, if you do nothing, they will finally multiply up to a point that they will make it impossible for you to go to work. The same way, if you can keep their numbers low by killing them in the environment, by killing, by, um, um, killing them in, in the, in, in, around the board, you will see that uh, the, the animals are more healthy because you have made it difficult for the infection to spread. Another thing you do in that place is what is called a quarantine. That is, uh, you see the animal that is sick, you withdraw the animal before it spreads the sickness to others. So every good farm should have what in our children's school they call a sick bay. So every every commercial poultry farm, however, even if you have just one pet, it's good to find a corner somewhere that is like your own sick bay, where you keep those that are looking sick so that they do not spread the sickness to others. Then there are things that you give into the birds to fortify the birds. For instance, when there is um, Cold. In the good old days, our mothers give us more peppery food, they give us hot food and all of that. They give us certain types of herbs to take. What are they doing? They are trying to strengthen us against the, the cold. Today, because we are now more modern, our mothers give us vitamin C, they give us zinc to take. What are they doing? They are fortifying us against the cold uh, season. The same way, there are things you can give to birds to, in their feed, in their water, that fortifies them against certain infections. So we should familiarize ourselves with all this, and they depend on season. It's a whole topic on its own. In this, in this season, give this. In that season, give that. And that we need to familiarize ourselves with and give them so that the, the birds are better able to fight disease or to fight the environmental conditions that would have made them to fall sick. 
and about the prevention of uh, danger by using our records properly. If you keep your records properly and you and you examine your record, many in many farms we keep records, but we don't use the records. So the the same thing that happened to us last year may still happen to us this year again because we did not we were not uh, using looking at our records to to take necessary action. So it's good to look at our records and based on our records, how many birds were dying before? Maybe average of two birds per week used to die, but on a single day. 15 birds died. You have to say what happened. Okay, maybe it was accidental. Maybe they, maybe there was stampeding. Maybe then you wait. The second day, it became 25. Then you must say if 15 died yesterday, 25 died today. What do we know that will happen tomorrow? Let's act quickly. So, but if we are taking records, but we are not looking at records. God forbid, if it's an outbreak of Gumboro and you have 15 today, 25 tomorrow, and you didn't do anything, by the third day, the figure will, will skyrocket. And by that time, it is too late to intervene. So that's why record keeping and record monitoring is important. And to be able to act on records, not just the owner of the farm, but even up to the attendant, they must understand what are your early alert signs at critical control points. That is, if so, 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 and so happens, raise alarm. If you see so, 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 and so, raise alarm. So that things don't go from bad to worse before we know that something is wrong. For instance, in farms where their records are very sophisticated, when water consumption changes up to a point, the boys are still looking okay. What has just changed is water consumption. There is a point at which you will raise alarm and say, this, this, they are changing water consumption. Please come and look at it. The person raising alarm may not know what is wrong, may not know what to do, but at least he knows that when it reaches this point, I should raise alarm. Feed consumption, that if feed is like this, like this, raise alarm. In cages, birds in cages, they say when you come in the morning, uh, Look at the ground at their faces. Count the point where you see greenish faces. When you count up to so 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 number, let us know. So that the person, the attendant, who probably is just a school staff holder, can say, Sir, I counted 15 green spots today. You told me that if I count 15 green spots, I should raise alarm. It has reached 15. Then you can you can call in the veterinarian to see what could be causing greenish diarrhea because. Is not to just say greenish diarrhea. There is new castle. There may be several reasons why you are having greenish diarrhea. So we should establish for ourselves at what point should we say this is a problem or this is a sign of a problem. So, and then we must establish our alert response uh, system for the prevention of danger. I gave the example, if he says, if, it, if this happens, call this person. If this happens, take this action. These are things that we must establish on our farms. And they are, they are not difficult to say. They are very basic things. You say, ah, if you see the birds dropping their wings, or if you see 20 birds dropping their wings, raise a lot. If you clap in the morning and they don't raise their heads, raise a Call me. Simple, simple things like that are um, critical things that we, we should um, uh, establish with our um, farm hands that they should be able to respond to. Well, uh, then we can monitor and evaluate. Next, quickly, quickly, quickly. Let's let's take uh, notes of a few things. Disinfectants. To get a good disinfectant, you should consider their composition and uh, uh, um, several other things have to be lifted. But the bacteria kill time is key. How quickly do, does, the bacteria, does the disinfectant act, act? And this is important because many people just think a disinfectant is a disinfectant. So for many women, they will say, I will carry the towel from home to the farm. The towel 
is, is a domestic grade disinfectant. It is not for the farm. The people in the, the jams in the farm, they are stronger than the top. So, so you must, the disinfectants differ in their ability to act. And then I, I, I like to explain to us because of if you have, if you have a if you have a commercial poultry farm, go and ask for what is called a quark glute disinfectant. You may not be able to use it all year round, but at intervals you must be using quark glute disinfectant because they are the most effective of disinfectant. They may be the most expensive, but they are the most effective. How do they act? The, the alcohol there removes the uh, lipids from the cell wall. The quaternary ammonium con compound penetrates inside the cell wall, dragging the glutaraldehyde, which kills the nucleus. So when you have a quad glute disinfectant, it will kill the germs that it comes into contact with. It is sometimes very expensive or rather expensive, but it is good. So at intervals, you should use, if you might not shuttle with your regular formaldehyde and the rest of them. But at, in, at intervals, you should use. We've heard about water sanitizers many times. Uh, uh, I, I may not spend too much time on that. But just to remind us that if you don't sanitize your water, gradually your pipes will become dirty inside and you will not be able to see a dirty pipe inside. But what that means is that you are giving clean water to your boats. The pipe is dirty in the water. So finally, there is clean water at the source, but there is dirty water. And it's not just dirty for dirty sake, it's dirty and full of germs. So that's why water sanitation is important. Uh, it is part of biosecurity to give additives to your boss. I spoke about it uh, earlier, this is the detail. Supplemental vitamins, minerals, especially trace minerals, toxin binders, water sanitizers, liver tonics, acidifiers, antioxidants and enzymes. Sometimes just adding phytase to, to feed increases the ability of the birds to absorb more. And because they absorb more from the feed, they are able to use the, uh, the benefits better for health promotion because the healthier you are, the more uh, you are able to perform very well. Now, I, I like to, as we, as we get ready to close, say to us that technology aids us in promoting biosecurity. So all of us who are interested in um, improve health for our birds should take the place of technology serious. Let us patronize laboratories, let us patronize knowledge workers, health workers, because they will help us a lot in ensuring that our birds stay healthy. Some of the procedures uh, that we enable that to happen is they should screen our day-old chicks. We should analyze our feed from time to time. We should do what is called seromonitoring. Come and check my birds if they are healthy. It is like doing medical checkup among human beings. Seromonitoring in birds is like medical checkup for human beings. Water tests across seasons, particularly if you are running a large farm, check your water during the rainy season, check your water during this dry season. It is also possible, it is cost that is not making us to do it. But if a commercial farm, vaccine potency test is very useful. After you are vaccinated, you can check if the vaccine work. It's possible to check. Then the one we are used to, pathology and microbiology, so my boss died, help me check them. Then you can also do a drug sensitivity test and even drug effectiveness tests. And when the birds are gone, can check the hygiene level of your of your farm. Now, every farm should have a schedule of the things to do to ensure good biosecurity. And uh, when we do that, we should have we should indicate the quality and types of agents to use. I'm talking about that, uh, disinfectant, detergent, and uh, boots, and all the other things. Then we should also say something about the timetable for their use. Then evaluation and alert system. For instance, you can say in our farm, we clean our net every day. We change our foot deep water twice a day. 
um, we 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 use this bus, this disinfectant in January. We are going to use this disinfectant in February. We are going to use this disinfectant in March. Let it be. Let there be a timetable for all these things, so that people can be committed to them. If you don't make it a schedule, it's possible that people will say everybody's work is nobody's work. So say what should be done. Say when it should be done. Say who should do it. And in some places, in some sophisticated places, they even say how it should be done. That is, you 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 develop SOPs, standard operating procedures, to say this is how you are going to behave when this happens, when that happens. I think I should uh, stop here. And so I like to say to us that uh, good farming practices uh, can make poultry farming rewarding. And um, everyone who who wants to be to profit from poultry should take biosecurity important because it's a major practice that will enhance our profitability. So when people say poultry is stressful, but I think what we came looking for is the success of poultry. If it is success that we want, we must know that biosecurity is important. So I ask you, stress of, or success, you choose. I, but I appeal to you, choose success. Don't choose stress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Adebayo Kolade. Well, Dr. Kolade is still uh, on hand waiting because it's time for us to go into discussion. Uh, before we go, I'll allow Dr. Kolade to pick, uh, catch a breather. And I have some dignities in our midst. I will not fail to recognize their presence. I, I have in our midst uh, Dr. Joko Tagba. Dr. Joko, you're welcome. I have uh, Dr. Lofun Keolu Ole, you're welcome. Dr. Lucky, all the way from Abuja. It's good to see you. Sheikola Ole, you're there. Mrs. Hazwa, yes. It's good to have you in the house. Uh, we have Dr. Shadia Jassin in the house earlier. Uh, Dr. Mondi or Jemiru in the house too earlier. Kendi Adenikpekun, it's good to have you in the house. Yes, everyone, it's good to have you all in the house. It's time we've listened to Dr. Bayokola. He has... He has done justice to this conversation on biosecurity. It is good that we are discussing this at this very point in time that the weather is slightly changing from the cold season that we used to have to we're going towards a dry season in some part of the country. And things will also change. I know some of us may have questions for Dr. Kolade in the house. Uh, I will leave the floor open to pick questions at this very moment. If you have any questions for him, please, you can signify by raising your hand, using the raise hand key, so that he can pick our questions as soon as possible. Also, I would like to encourage us to pull down our names, the way we want it to appear on the certificate. Our names, our names and phone number the way we want it to appear on the certificate, if possible. Oh, sorry, we need to include our emails too. Name, phone number, and emails. Sorry, pardon me. Name, phone number, and emails so that it can be mailed to us. Mail, phone number, and emails so that the certificate can be mailed to us. You cannot use space to separate them. All other for but space, my phone, my email, space, my phone number so that we can get it across to us in one piece. If you have any question, it's time to talk about it. Although me, I want Dr. Kolade to please uh, explain further on the critical control point and how we can apply that in poultry industry using Nigeria as a yardstick. I have a question also in the chat box. I'll pick that question too. I said, how do we mitigate against climate change? Climate change related risk in biosecurity. How do we mitigate against climate change related risk in biosecurity? Are there other techniques or method that is workable in these regards? Uh, that's um, Stephen Adams. Although, would I prefer you asking these questions in person? It helps because there are some things we may not pick that are your stress impact. Dr. Kolade, I would like you to take over the floor, sir. 
Okay. Uh, is question about how do we mitigate against climate change related risk is very broad. But I want to let me assume, for instance, that is a Kogiman where there is flood now as a consequence of climate change. How do we mitigate? The first thing is to establish what your risks are. are. So that if you establish what your risks are, then you can start answering the question, how do I mitigate against those risks? Well, I, I, another one is that now in many parts of the world, uh, when it's hot, it's very hot. When it's cold, it's very cold. So that uh, range is widening now. So, so then you now say, how hot does it get in my place? So, and that can help us uh, to adjust our biosecurity. For instance, it is, the, it is the reason why in many places they say that your disinfectant spray should be done between 12 and 1 p.m., where you are lowering the, the, uh, the, the jam load, and at the same time, you are cooling your animals. You see that we are, we are combating sickness and we are combating climate change at the same time. So this, the, the way I will just answer for you is, first of all, be aware of what climate change has done to practice in your environment. If you are aware of what climate change has done in your environment, you can prepare appropriately. There are places that are waterlogged areas. There are places that are prone to flooding. There are places that are prone to very sharp increases during heat stress. So what will be the reaction will now depend on the impact of climate change in your area. For instance, in some places in the Philippines, you cannot even do poultry on the floor because flood will arrive at any time. So if even your Christmas broiler is raised in an upstairs pen. That is a response to climate change that is happening, that is affecting practice. And so the same, that will now affect how a number of other things that we have spoken today will be carried out. How the security system will be updated, how the um, access control will be done, how this, even disinfection will be done, will now differ because the, you have responded to climate change. So that's, that's that. So be aware of what climate change has changed in your environment. Then we will now tackle it one by one. And you talked about uh, critical control. Before you, before you talk about critical control points, I would like to also allow you to catch a little breath Why I introduce some other dignities in the house so that uh, we won't blow you with a lot of pressure. I have Dr. Umar Usman in our midst. Yeah, it's important for me to even call his name because I will allow him to speak a bit on biosecurity uh, and the northern approach because it's, we have the northern and the southern part of Nigeria. So Dr. Usman, you're welcome to the house. I also have in our midst Dr. Olamide Agbato, the head of Animal Collaboratory in Abuja. So you are also welcome. Uh, there's another question in the in the chat box. But before I pick that, I will allow you to uh, respond. I, I won't forget. Uh, let Dr. Usman speak now that he's in the house. Okay. Dr. Dr. Usman. Please unmute you yourself. Thank you, Dr. I, I actually came to listen and learn from uh, Taco and uh, Kolade. Um, but, but I will just say this in passing, one sentence, and that is that uh, biosecurity is a is a universal phenomenon and um, has not got any regional changes to it at all uh, by definition, by structure, and by application. So there are no differences wherever you are. Uh, 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 like the theme suggested, it's a strict biosecurity. Uh, there's no better time than to emphasize this subject. And I, I thumbs up for you, my. Uh, uh, brothers and friends. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Dr. Kolari. Thank you, sir. Um, well, for our listeners, Dr. Usman is a 
He's a senior colleague, he's a mentor to many of us, so it's a pleasure to have him come listen to us. Um, now on critical control points, we can answer, we can approach that point at two levels. One is at the level of uh, infrastructure, um, where or where should we raise alarm? For instance, they say uh, visitors are to park outside. So when a car passes that point, that has become a critical point. Say, Please, somebody has driven his car past where we say all cars should park. So they say, Then the one say, do you know who I am? I am the, when my father dies, I'm the one who will inherit this farm. What do you think you are saying? He passes. When he passes this point, it's a critical point where someone should raise alarm and say, this person has passed. Pass. They say, no entry. Because we want to be able to say, who entered the brooding room. Then somebody who is not authorized enters. It is a critical point that, it, because that entry of the brooding room is a critical control point. So that is the physicality of critical control points. Now, let's now go to the functional aspect of it. You say, for instance, I am, I am, in a broiler operation. The regular standard broiler operation will say maximum mortality per cycle, three to 5%. So when you want to have 3% mortality at the end of a five, six week cycle, what that means is that week one, let's say that you say for yourself, week one mortality must not exceed 1%. Week two, mortality must not exceed 0.5%. Every other week, mortality must not exist 0.5%. So the moment in week one, in a 1,000 bird flock, 1%, I think, is 10 birds. So the moment you lose more than 10 birds, it's a point at which alarm should be raised. So our critical control points uh, in, in a functional sense is that once we cross mortality of 10, we should raise alarm. In fact, once we, as we begin to approach 10 mortality, you should raise an alarm. So uh, by parameters, you can set parameters that when it, in, in, in the brooding house, if you have set a maximum temperature, you say once we approach so-so-so temperature, raise alarm. Otherwise, you will, you will get to 42 degrees and then in the morning, all oh, your. So you say, be monitoring this thing. Once temperature reaches, so, 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 so I'm, I'm not very sure now, and I don't want to spread rumor. Once temperature reaches, so, 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 and so, open the windows. Mm -hmm. So, and then, so the, the person, whoever the attendant is, knows that once I see, let's say, 39 degrees on the on the temperature dial, I must open the window. That is the critical control point. So like that, like that, like that, you say, you say once feed consumption falls to so, so, and so. In fact, if for, for layer board operation, there are farms where they will say, once production falls below 70%, call the boards. So any production below 70% means that these boards are not profitable to us again. That is a functional critical control point. So as the production is approaching that yeah, uh, 72, 71, somebody is raising an alarm that these balls is either they start climbing again or they are on their way out. So these are uh, things. So it is not cast in stone. Each, of, each farm has to say what are their own critical control points. Thank you.